Good afternoon and welcome to this Lunch and Learn hosted by the Edmonton Sexual Exploitation Working Group. Thank you for joining us either here or by webcast. Um, just for those of us who are here, we are filming, so if you do not want to be in the shot of the camera, please just seat off to the edges of the um, auditorium. Um, please feel free throughout the event to uh, tweet using our hashtags, YAG Talk Sexploit or SUA2018. Uh, and please help yourself to some coffee and some refreshments in the back. Um, my name is Jordan Marcishu and I am the Youth Liaison on the Neighborhood Empowerment Team from the Family Center, and I am a member of the Sexual Exploitation Working Group, or SUG. I would like to respectfully recognize that we are meeting on the traditional land of Treaty 6 territory. This is a traditional territory of the diverse Indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this ten territory for centuries, including Cree, Diné, Soto, Blackfoot, Sioux, as well as Métis and Inuit. We are dedicated to working together with these diverse communities and settlers from around the world. You might notice before me is a vase of orange flowers, an orange scarf, and an orange candle. And there's also many of us within the auditorium wearing um, orange clothing or an orange ribbon. The color orange is a color often associated with freedom movements around the world. It symbolizes change, energy, and warmth and, compa and compassion. These flowers are a symbol of more than 42 women who are known to be murder victims in the past 37 years in Edmonton, and of the many that are missing or have died due to the effects of sexual exploitation. This week is our Sexual Exploitation Week of Awareness, and through these symbols, we would like to remember all the children, youth, and adults who have died or are missing, and the families and communities who grieve their loss, as well as all of those who are struggling today. SUG is a collaborative of community partners, law enforcement, municipal and provincial government agencies, and REACH Edmonton. The group is concerned for those who are vulnerable to sexual exploitation due to age, financial, financial desperation, migration, homelessness, prior ch childhood abuse or neglect, mental or physical health conditions, intergenerational trauma, addictions, or any other circumstances that contribute to vulnerability. We use the UN definition of sexual exploitation, which talks about an abuse of power to profit monetarily, socially, or politically from sexual exploitation of another person. The member of, members of SUG are Action Coalition on Human Trafficking, Alberta Health Services Addictions and Mental Health, Bent Arrow Traditional Healing Society, Catholic Social Services, uh, their youth follow-up program, uh, CEASE, which is the Center to End All Sexual Exploitation, Child and Family Services, the Piseca Branch, City of Edmonton City Services, uh, City of Edmonton Council Liaison, which is uh, Councillor Hamilton, Edmonton Police Service, Human, Human Trafficking and Exploitation Unit, Reach Edmonton Council for Safe Communities, the Sexual Assault Center of Edmonton, and the Family Center. We know that some of you today may have some questions, so there should be some cue cards on your tables as well as some pens. Um, if you have a question, please write on the cue card and pass it to the middle of just the, the walkway up here, and there will be SUG representatives coming to grab the cue cards from you. Um, facilitating this Lunch and Learn today is Kathleen Quinn, Executive Director of CEASE, and Staff Sergeant Dale Johnson of the Edmonton Police Service Human Trafficking and Exploitation Unit. Um, we're fortunate to have Kate sitting as co-chair of SUG, and Staff Sergeant is a dedicated SUG member. I think it's important to acknowledge the name change EPS took approximately a year ago from Vice Unit to Human Trafficking and Exploitation Unit, which demonstrates the positive shift Edmonton Police are taking to support those involved in human trafficking. Both Kate and Dale are committed to improving the lives of all Ed Edmontonians, and we are fortunate to have them here today to share their expertise on the demand side of human trafficking in Edmonton. Welcome, Kate and Dale. Thank you. Well all right, I suppose we'll just jump right in then. Uh, sorry. So this first slide I just wanted to point out is a, it's an old slide, or an old uh, sign that used to be posted along the 95th Street, 118 Ave corridors, which was uh, a common area for street level uh, sex activity back in the day. It's still somewhat busy today, but nothing like it was. These signs were always, they were intended to uh, deter uh, prostitution and deter Johns in the area. Uh, Kate had a large 
uh, part in their being uh, being put up back in the time. Uh, they've been taken down since that time with the gentrification of, the, of that area and, and uh, the risk of stigmatizing that community. But uh, the Reporting John program still exists and uh, it is still something that people can access through the website, the EPS website. So I just wanted to start by introducing that and you know, it just references the fact that we have a long history with the EPS and uh, organizations like CEASE in, in working together to deter uh, buyers of sex. Uh, this next slide, uh, EPS's priority, we go, it does go back to the 1990s. I don't know if Kate had something she wished to say around this, but uh, uh, it has been a priority of the EPS, uh, the beat community, the beat officers that walk that uh, area, including 107th Avenue. Uh, we have a long history there. Uh, we have arrested Johns and uh, undertaken stings to target Johns for uh, many, many years, going back early, early, late 90s, probably early 2000s. Uh, just for a sake of interest, last year, 2017, we arrested 295 individuals attempting to purchase sex. Uh, that was a series of different, uh, different stings. We had 11 online stings and 13 street stings. Uh, pretty much evenly split, 156 Johns arrested online, 139 Johns arrested through street stings. That was the first year that we had made a concerted effort to target Johns uh, through the online advertisements that are, are common out there. Prior to that, our, our arrests were restricted to street operations. You can see historically the numbers, uh, they dipped in 2014, 2015. That had a large part to do with the changing of the federal legislation. Uh, you may or may not be overly familiar with that, but the Protection of Communities and Exploited Persons Act was brought in at that time. Uh, so there was some confusion amongst law enforcement. There was some confusion amongst, amongst Crown prosecutors on how that change in legislation would affect uh, or the enforcement as well as the prosecution. So those, that's uh, what attributes to the lower numbers in 14 and 15, uh, though they begin to rise again in 16 and, and of course, uh, peak in 2017 due to the uh, prevalence of online activity. I, I will also state that that's about as much as the system can handle. When you look at police, uh, when you look at courts, and you look at uh, what we'll talk about later, the STOP program, uh, 295 individuals isn't uh, near the demand that's out there, uh, but it, it's unfortunately the, about the capacity the system can handle. For each person that we do arrest online, and uh, the conversation occurs between an officer and that individual and then they ultimately arrive at the hotel. There's likely 20 other conversations that are occurring online that the individuals don't carry through or, or the conversation uh, uh, ends without a person arriving at the hotel. So again, it's a small fraction that we arrest admittedly, but uh, uh, it, is, it is important. Great. I'd like to just begin with a little caveat and say uh, we know what we know. We know through experience and through listening to men and women and others in the sex trade, and we don't know everything. So there may be some of you in the audience who have knowledge to contribute, and we certainly invite you to do that. Uh, this has always been uh, something that I think we need to be aware of, is where do buyers search and buy? And there's, there's a range. The street, those of us in impacted communities know that story all too well. Uh, and then what happened in the, uh, the mid 90s is the internet was, uh, became a factor of all of our lives and that changed the, the locations where people, where men would buy sex. So that's opened up a whole bunch of other possibilities. Public uh, internet buying sites, there's many. The most common one is backpage.com, but there are many. There's what is also called closed buyer networks. Sometimes these can be within ethnocultural communities where a, a house or an apartment might be set up and the word goes around the men in the community and they all go there and buy sex. Or it can be a really intentional gathering. Uh, I just read a, a kind of a disturbing article in Seattle where a group of men who were regular reviewers on a review board formed a little mini club called the uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, and they focused exclusively on buying sex from South Korean women who had been brought into Seattle. Um, there's also groups where, where uh, 
people go onto review boards. There's again some common review boards, escort review boards, and they and uh, exchanges are are made on those review boards. People men also go to body rub center websites, check out you know what that center is offering, and then uh, phone or text and make contact. Similarly with escort agency websites and there are many independent escort websites as well and you can follow on Twitter Facebook I forgot Instagram you could also follow any social media that is out there there's a way to buy sex services from from anyone I think one uh, little story I'd like to add in uh, to this closed buyer network concept is that there was a house in the West End that uh, uh, women, Asian women were being lured from different uh, parts of Canada to Edmonton and the, uh, taken to this house where they were forced to sell sex. They, there was a house where they slept and then they were transported to sell sex. One of the women there knew enough to call 911. Uh, but these are the highly invisible buyers of sex and the only way they are noticed is if neighbors, neighbors of houses, neighbors of apartments, condos. If you notice suspicious activity, report that to the police. Similarly, that happened where a group of, of young girls were uh, kind of being circulated through a house in the West End and it was their mothers who started to notice something strange was happening and called the police. So this is part of the role of, of citizens is to be aware and to report. Doesn't necessarily mean you'll hear the end of the story, but your, our role as citizens is to provide police with information that they can then investigate. Put this up here because again, within the, the buyer network, there's a continuum and these, these are all along, there are men all along the continuum. I have not captured everyone, but there are people who are, there are men who are casual and first time. We learn that when, at, through the sex trade opinion, uh, program. There's others who, you know, are casual maybe once a year or maybe every couple of years. What we do know is that the more one engages in this activity, the more likely you are to keep repeating and repeating. Some men see themselves as uh, being in romantic relationships with some of the women. What they don't know often is that women are selling them the lie that they're in a romantic relationship because what the women need is their money. But some men like to operate that under that assumption, I'm a good guy, I'm helping her, and I'm, um, you know, I'm paying for what she needs or what her, she and her children need. There are men who become regulars that women can depend upon when they are short of money. It's interesting though, I think they always ask for sex. And then at the far end are the men who are the hobbyists. And this is their name for themselves, not my name. And this again is what the internet has facilitated. In the early 90s, there were single men driving single vehicles up and down 95th Street and 118th Ave. They did not communicate unless they were in a closed buyer network in a community. But the internet has facilitated this connection amongst, amongst men. And so there are some men who spend you know, hours every week trying to decide who they will buy and, um, and then reviewing the, the woman whose services they buy. These are some of the reasons why men who attend the sex trade offender program tell us they buy sex. We, we have a section you'll see later in the curriculum where we ask them why were you out there. But cheap and anonymous, no relationship needed, no attachment, it's convenient, there's an abundance of sex uh, ads advertised uh, anywhere and everywhere so that abundance um, you know, tempts some men to buy. Others talk about loneliness, stress, not knowing how to be in healthy relationships. Uh, others are in relationships, but they're having relationship problems or they're separated or divorced. Others have told us about insecurity, low self-esteem, and that somehow, you know, trying to buy sex helps them feel better. Some have talked to us about the impact of pornography and others have stood up and told us that they're, they are addicted to sex. Others are using alcohol and drugs. We know that always impairs our judgments and make quick decisions. And others have just admitted to being greedy and self-centered and curious. Okay, as uh, we both mentioned earlier, there's something called in Edmonton the STOP program. 
uh, sex trade offender program. It used to be called the prostitution offender program. It may have had a name before that. But uh, it goes back a long way. Again, Kate was very instrumental in its creation as far back as 1996. Uh, not something necessarily unique to Edmonton, Edmonton, but certainly Edmonton is a leader. Uh, many jurisdictions across Canada have pro approached Kate uh, to look for guidance and advice on how to create programs of their own. Grand Prairie and uh, recently a city from Quebec has reached out to Edmonton to emulate what we're trying to do here through the program. Uh, commonly called John School, of course, but it's it's uh, best understood as a court deferral program meant to educate offenders about the harmful harmful realities of participation in the sex industry. So, essentially, once an individual has been arrested by the police, their uh, their matter goes through the prosecution office, and they make a decision in consultation with. Uh, probation officers and whatnot as to a person's suitability for the program. At the moment, and I think long, sta long standing, about 80% of those that are charged are eligible. You can't have any sort of uh, violent offenses or sexually related offenses on your criminal record, uh, but you can have a criminal record. It could be sort of something uh, less, uh, um, less related, so to speak. So theft, frauds, things like that, would you could still be eligible. Uh, so about 80% of those are arrest uh, uh, do attend. We have a very low recidivism rate. Uh, it's difficult to measure recidivism, obviously, uh, but we don't tend to re-arrest the same individuals over and over. Although admittedly we did in 2017, we arrested one man twice and another man three times. They are very much the outliers. Uh, people uh, speak highly of the program, those that have taken it, and uh, they, they uh, leave that program with a much better understanding of of the harms that they bring to to individuals. Uh, sure, and just to, to build on that, uh, I kind of have an interesting privilege in that that a number of the men call me, and the, one of the individuals who was rearrested uh, was he called and we talked about what happened because he had come to the stop program. So I said, was there anything that we could have done differently? And he said, no, it's not. The program was excellent. He said, I've recognized now that I'm really dealing with sexual addiction. And we have had psychologists look at our program curriculum and they've said, you know, you're doing the best you can in eight hours as an adult alternative measures program. If a man is working, is struggling with serious addiction issues, he's going to have to do some of his own work, go to counseling, go to self-help groups. He may get arrested again. But uh, when this has happened, and the men have been honest with us, they've said, now I know I really need help. I thought I could do it on my own. I got arrested again. Uh, I'm not, so you can measure success in different ways. It can look, oh dear, you know, he got arrested again. Or, oh no, it was the, the real turning point for him uh, to make changes. And this man talked about uh, being exposed to pornography by his father as a child and the, and at the time he got rearrested his um, family was out of the country and he allowed himself to go looking again so he said now I know I have to change and the last comment I'll make is just so people are clear it's not a necessarily a get out of jail free card people do pay uh, $750 the price recently has gone up to participate and a successful plea completion in lieu of a criminal conviction mm -hmm. And some uh, men, every, every year we have at least one man who phones and asks if he can come voluntarily. And some men also come as part of a, a sentence, a probation sentence. So we're going to talk a little bit about the STOP program. And I just want to paint the picture again. The man is arrested, then the Crown Prosecution uh, Office decides whether he's eligible or not. And then he goes to court for his first appearance. And then he's referred to the probation. We have some of our probation team here. And that's been a really great uh, addition to our kind of process through the criminal justice system because they have the chance to really talk to the men. And if they accept responsibility for their actions, they're then referred to the sex trade offender program where people like me meet with them. Essentially, this uh, curriculum is an eight-hour day. We begin around 8.15 and we end around 4.30. And we have uh, structured the curriculum over the years, again with feedback from educators and psychologists. The goal is to inform 
to educate and to build empathy. And so that's why it's structured like, like this. So we begin with our Crown prosecutors going over all the laws that uh, relate to um, the sex trade. And then our EPS, uh, HTE unit, and RCMP care uh, really take the men into the, the, the picture of the sex trade uh, using some uh, clips from a video that CBC filmed in Edmonton called Too Young to Lose. You can watch that on your own later. And then, uh, you know, talking about the uh, RCMP investigations into murdered and missing women and explaining the role of all the different people in the sex trade. We're really pleased at our uh, program just this past Saturday. We had a man who was a former sex buyer. He uh, came to our March 3rd program, and he uh, has said, I've been a sex buyer since I was 18, 35 years old, and I want to be part of the solution. And this really is opening up a whole new area of education for the men. Our probation officers talk about the consequences. Again, if you, the next time, if you do this another time and you're arrested, you will uh, not be going to the STOP program and chances are you will be meeting with probation officers um, and you will have a criminal record. The health risks and the facts uh, are presented by our Alberta Health Services STI outreach team. And this, I think, is really important to know that uh, AHS sees it as a really important use of their nurse time on a Saturday to come and offer voluntary testing because syphilis and gonorrhea remain at outbreak stage in Edmonton and it's something that uh, uh, we have not as a society been able to crack crack yet. We're still at a high level. So we usually have a third of the men who opt for voluntary testing over the noon hour and if not we encourage them to to go to uh, their doctor and get tested. Then that takes us into the afternoon and that's where we begin to see a bit of a shift. The first part of the afternoon is where we have a psychologist and mental health therapist and a man who's a member of a sex addictions group. And they really talk with the men and I've always been surprised kind of hanging around on the edge how honest men are when they're saying why I was out there, what I was looking for. And I sometimes wonder, is this the first time they've had a chance to talk at that level? This made my uh, day today. Just before coming over here, I got an email from one of the probation officers. And one of the men at the Saturday program wants the name of the counselor who was asking these questions. This is good news from our perspective. But I'm really impressed, too, with the sex addiction um, group member. We've had this, uh, we've had different men participate over the years since, since the very beginning. And again, really cracking open the re realities of sexual addiction and, and talking about it. There's sex, sex addiction groups throughout the city at any time of the day or night. And uh, it really helps men with accountability. It's important to go to counseling, but it's the self-help groups that help with accountability. Then we move into small group scenarios where we ask the men to put themselves in the shoes either of people in residential communities or in the shoes of the women who are maybe at the other end of that sex ad and they want to make a date with. And we uh, ask them to say, you know, what would you, how would you feel? What would you do? And then the next part is the shift into listening to women and men who have, have been in the sex trade to their life experiences and listening to a mother whose daughter is among the murdered and missing. And the feedback is that, that those sessions uh, are the most important of the day. Men appreciate the information, they appreciate the education, but it's listening to those real life stories that that begins to be a change. We do ask the men, each one to stand up at the end of the day and tell us about what they've learned and what's an action they will take upon leaving. And I, I wish we could capture those stories of um, what they say at the end. Thanks. Yeah. And there's a, about eight classes a year yes. uh, on a Saturday. And uh, about 30 to 40 uh, people in each class. I won't speak uh, too much on this, but the demographics, because Kate will get into it at, at, at length here. but. Uh, essentially, from our perspective as police officers, th there's really not a typical offender. 
I mean, people are of all ages, from teen adults to senior citizens. Uh, more often than not, they're married. More often than not, they have children at home. Uh, typically from, or sorry, not typically, but they're from all uh, all uh, spectrums of society and, and economic status. Uh, one thing that is a little bit interesting to us as police officers, 60% uh, uh, will tell us that they didn't even know it was necessarily illegal to buy sex. And I can't think of many other criminal offenses that are less understood uh, and by the common uh, person. I mean, everyone understands that theft is illegal, fraud is illegal, uh, impaired driving, but people will say, I did not realize it was illegal to buy sex. And understandably, the laws are a little bit confusing. Uh, simply put, the laws are, it, it's illegal to buy sex, but it's not illegal to buy, or to sell sex. Uh, it's not illegal to advertise their own sexual services. So people see that, I suppose, and they, they just imagine that, well, if they're advertising, it must be legal then for me to buy. Uh, so some sympathy to them in terms of their un misunderstanding of the law, but uh, uh, again, ignorance is not, is not an excuse. So let's look a little bit at the, the data underneath that first slide. We are, I, I put up five years of data just so we can begin to look at, look at some of the shifts. So until around 2013, like from the beginning, 1996 to 2013, uh, men identified as being in the trades. That number stayed consistent for all those years. And this is what the men say. Uh, they, we have a survey, they fill it in, we take their word. But we're seeing an interesting downward slide. And I don't want to be, uh, to say it's about the economy, but that certainly makes me raise that question. Is it, is it about the economy? If we've seen a number of men in the trades leaving Edmonton or not coming down from the north or from the oil fields, it's a question. And I think we need a bit uh, more data before we can say that. And we would need to put it, to contrast that with other uh, data provided through StatsCan and other, other sources. So interestingly enough, too, we're seeing in, in 2018 a little uh, a spike up uh, in those in the professions. And we're going to be tracking what is the difference between those arrested through street stings and those arrested through hotel stings. So it'll, it'll take a little while, a couple years of, being, of looking at this before we can definitely say uh, what's happening there. In terms of education and household income, you can see that uh, you know 39% completed high school and 37% went on to college or, or tech. So this too, I think, reflects a lot of our Edmonton population. Household income, essentially, th would, they would be men of middle income, 45% earning over 75,000, and and uh, another 16% in that 50 to 75,000 dollar range. Relationship status. Again, this hovers around the 50% mark. It changes a little bit uh, over uh, every year. But the significant fact is that there's a num good number of men who are in married uh, or committed relationships who are buying sex. And what impact does that have on the relationship with their spouse? And what impact does that have on the relationship with the children? That's why we track how many men identify that they have children. Again, some of the stories that I've heard from women whose husbands were buyers is uh, in many cases it has ended in divorce because of the deep betrayal and the lack of trust. Uh, I've heard about the impact on young adults when they heard that their dad was buying sex and uh, you know, betraying their mother and they, they began to wonder could they ever trust uh, a man in a relationship. So it, this has ripple, ripple effects that we often don't think about or talk about in our society. Okay. Heritage, again, uh, Edmonton is a really diverse city and I think that the, the uh, diversity of men we see at the STOP program reflects our Edmonton reality. You can see that 57% uh, of the men who attend were born in Canada. We uh, are a little bit higher on the number of people who are of immigrant heritage uh, who are arrested and uh, end up at the program. We have had a couple of international students and we have had a couple of temporary foreign workers. 
what, uh, what I think this points to us is a, a challenge. How do we work with ethnocultural communities to educate uh, men about the, the laws and about the resources and about, uh, you know, maybe there's some language translation that we need to provide uh, some of the communities. At the, at the program on Saturday, one man asked me if he came actually to translate for his brother. Could we translate something about the laws into Arabic? So this is a, a go-forward project that we uh, are working on with EPS to provide a couple of um, basic fact sheets in other languages. In 2015, we began asking men about their, uh, do they ever view pornography, uh, especially sexually violent and degrading images. It's too early for us to speak with any authority about this. And again, we will be looking to other research done in the community, but we thought it was important to understand, is this a dynamic, especially with the uh, great use of the internet um, in, our, in all of our lives and how easy it is to be exposed to uh, images. So far, the youngest age of viewing has been 10, and there have been a number of 10 and 11-year-olds, uh, men who identified 10 and 11-year-old. We also have questions on sex addiction on the surveys, and our, our kind of our ballpark figure is that about 35% of the men identify that they're struggling with a behavior that they feel is out of control. Yes, and as it says, our, uh, we're tra trying to track the differences between uh, the buyers of sex online and the buyers of sex from the street, which is certainly not an easy thing to do. And, and from, again, from a policeman's perspective, uh, not as a uh, academic, however, there certainly has to be a level of or degree of um, sort of control that, that the buyers want to look for there, the, the element of power and control. Uh, certainly, buying sex online, the, the degree that you can negotiate price and negotiate act is, is much less. The escorts are in a, a, a more of a position of power when it comes to that than the girls on the street who are, are certainly the most marginalized, certainly the most uh, desperate in, in why they're there in the very first place. So I, I think there is a degree or some segment of the, of the buyers that want to s take advantage of that. And, and they feel they can probably get away with more, they can probably pay less. Uh, they may have an opportunity to, to assault or abuse those women in ways that uh, an escort uh, would be less likely in, in the situation with an escort. So marketing to sex buyers uh, I'll just start by saying Edmonton uh, sees a great deal of escorts coming from Quebec. Uh, there's likely a number of reasons why and some of it's economic, some of it's uh, market saturation, some of it's uh, the, perceive, the perception that there's a larger segment of, of uh, men with money here in Alberta, but there's certainly no uh, doubt about it that a large large percentage of the escorts that we encounter and we interact with from an outreach outreach perspective are from Quebec uh, certainly women of Asian backgrounds are seen in body rub centers suspected body rub centers the micro brothels uh, and they are advertised to the stereotype of, of uh, men who have a fetish or a fascination with, with Asian women, uh, the demure and, and uh, stereotype that comes with that. Uh, there's certainly a uh, segment that market to, to, the, to youth. Uh, some, some escort ads do market to being more mature, but the vast majority prey on the uh, image of youth and beauty, and that uh, is attractive to men. Utilize phase, uh, phrases in their ads, things like new in town or fresh. That's again Im implying that maybe that these women are younger or that, uh, that they're new to the industry and that again, a level of attraction to the buyer in that respect. Party girls, that refers to men that are looking to, to use drugs in, in uh, the sexual uh, session that they are willing to pay for. Again, all marketing to to the buyers and what they uh, are, are interested in. 
and some go as far to market uh, a lack of restrictions. So what I mean there is they'll essentially do any sexual act, protected or unprotected. Uh, again, some buyers that is uh, a driver and that is of interest to them. So uh, those are what the the ads will portray. Just a small sample of some of the ads that uh, pursue the you know youth and youth and beauty sells. It's really just as simple as that from a marketing perspective. We see many examples where escorts uh, purposely use ads not dissimilar from this, but uh, that is that is their marketing ploy and they know and they will tell us that it will greatly increase the likelihood of, of traffic coming to their ad and of John's answering and showing up at their hotel room. So again they're in a there is a degree of competition and and the the buyers have have expressed to these escorts that uh, youth and beauty sells. Can I just add there, when Dale and I were preparing this, uh, there's a number of images that we chose not to use because uh, we did not want to keep participating in the exploitation of uh, young people. But this would be probably the least exploitative ad uh, there's far far worse now this is suggestive but it's not explicit some are, are much more explicit so we'll speak just slight or briefly on backpage.com uh, obviously you may or may not know I suppose that it, it no longer exists but uh, it was uh, long regarded as the major website the most popular website for escorts it had a stranglehold on the on the uh, on the industry where vast majority of escorts and uh, traffickers of escorts would advertise sexual services had a worldwide reach uh, and and then through the United States and the work in the United States it's it was uh, accused of being complicit in the trafficking of women and young girls so that led to actually I should just say that though they, they have been quite cooperative with law enforcement and what they did what that centralized outlet of escorts allowed police ready access to outreach as well as setting up stings. Uh, so when the government moved in just recently in the United States and the FBI, as long as the department and along with the Department of Justice, seized the website. <coughs> sorry, seized the website, and that had to do with uh, freedom of expression laws in the United States changing. Won't get into that necessarily, but that look, website no longer exists. So that complicates. Uh, law enforcement's ability to access escorts in term, to offer outreach as well as to set up stings. Certainly the market will recover. I have no illusions that it won't. There are many, many sites out there less well known than Backpage.com which will uh, build and to fill the void but it'll be, it's yet to be seen whether the market will amalgamize itself into a large site like Backpage.com was or or if it will spread itself through lesser, uh, more uh, lesser uh, established sites. Either way, there's some unintended consequences. Nobody can argue with the intent of the law was to, uh, you know, prevent victimization and prevent trafficking of youth. I mean, obviously that's that's important. However, the unintended consequences are that there, it has thrown up a few hurdles in in uh, in front of law enforcement that we'll have to. Uh, overcome and reimagine how we do business. I'll, speak, I'll also like to speak a little about the underage demand. Uh, the demand is very real, to be frank. Uh, we have taken efforts just in the last, last little while to uh, change, not to change our direction, I was going to say that, but not to change our direction, but to, to expand our direction and move on to different sites and platforms and applications to uh, target adult men who are intent on uh, buying sex from underage girls. It, it's, uh, it's much more hidden than it is on Backpage.com to be frank. In my experience Backpage.com did a quite a good job of avoiding or eliminating the underage component to that uh, but the applications and sites out there, Whisper is one of them right now but there's many others. They uh, are being corrupted and used by uh, traffickers, uh, marginalized youth, and sometimes you know juveniles who are in, uh, looking to commercialize their own sexuality. 
to be to be honest. And we are now moving on to those those platforms. We are arresting men uh, intent on buying sex from 14, 15 year olds. We're we're posing there as uh, as young young people as well. So it's a it's not uh, a new area of police work, but it's a new area for our unit. And uh, I I see unfortunately I see. Uh, making arrests on their, through there on a regular basis. Could I just add, uh, Dale, for everyone's information, if um, a sex buyer is intentionally attempting to buy sex from underage girls, he will not be eligible for the Sex Trade Offender Program. And we also uh, have people here from our Protection of Sexually Exploited uh, Children team who uh, continue to work every day again with law enforcement to help those young people who are being exploited. I say we could probably talk a little bit more on this as well, but I mean there are a few younger people in this audience, and, and maybe you know there's websites out there like SugarDaddy.com, seeking arrangements, and those are you know that's a whole other aspect of this issue. Uh, and they may not necessarily always be uh, for money, but it is an exchange of sex for services. So very very complicated issue in today's society and and the attitudes of the youth and of course the buyers that are attracted to that so body rub centers kind of a hot button issue in this city a little bit for some uh, the city of Edmonton has long licensed body rub centers for almost over 20 years seen as a harm reduction approach uh, they have decided that licensing and regulating businesses and practitioners who work in them is a better alternative to uh, these individuals or women having to work in other uh, venues, be them micro brothels or, or uh, on the street or through escort servicing. So we as police officers, uh, the Edmund Police Service, we don't necessarily take a position on what is a political decision, but we are at the end of the day left to uh, attempt to deal with the issues or, or problems that it may create. Uh, what we do as police officers is we take a, a joint effort with the City of Edmonton bylaw inspection officers and we do outreach work at these establishments. They, it's an opportunity for us to make inroads and connections with the escort, or sorry, the uh, practitioners and uh, op break down some of the barriers that exist uh, between uh, them and the police historically to ensure that they feel comfortable with uh, reporting and that uh, you know we can make any observations that might be indicative of trafficking or, or underage. I can say though, uh, or I can say that uh, from my experience, the harm reduction approach is accomplishing what it's intended to do. We do not see any degree of uh, trafficking happening uh, explicitly in the centers. The girls will tell us that they are working there of their own volition and we have never encountered an underage woman uh, working in a body rep center. The issue though is sometimes when you overregulate a industry you create you have unintended consequences and right now we're seeing an uptick in the amount of suspected body rep centers so that's something that we're still trying to get a handle on uh, but they're operating as seemingly legitimate massage, uh, therapeutic massage, but the women working there are offering sexual services. So they're circumventing the city's regulation and, and uh, inspection process. And that's something, again, the city, the city police and other areas are trying to uh, contend with. One thing just to say is that uh, as part of this licensing uh, body rub parlors, the city has p set a pretty high bar with respect to the owners who have to work on, sign on to a control plan, which then they can be held accountable to. So uh, again, that doesn't necessarily work for others who uh, oh, don't want that much oversight. So that's why we're seeing this slippage into other um, venues. Just an example of some of the advertisements uh, that relate to body rub centers. Uh, just a little bit of a history. The practitioners do take a course. Uh, it's a three hour uh, information session hosted by the City of Edmonton and others. Uh, allows them some insight into the industry that they're choosing to embark upon. There allows them some understanding of the 
current laws, bylaws, human rights, support services available, health services available, things of that nature. Right now, though, the, the city has no power to uh, compel owners to participate in any, in any similar sort of information session. So right now it's uh, just directed at practitioners. Again, a little bit of an advertisement that I just we put up here just to this one almost crosses the line uh, it's, it's it's from our perspective deemed inappropriate and may not necessarily be illegal but uh, again what what the attract or trying to presumably present what the attraction is for for people to get into the industry they talk about women being able to make five to seven hundred dollars in a shift which is, is a great, great exaggeration to be from the, our experience in contact with the women, they, that's uh, very, very inflated. We also wanted to talk a little bit about one of the other parts of this very complex circle, and that is uh, the, the people who are traffickers. And this, these uh, stats are from an RCMP study in 2013. I'm disturbed that the age range is 19 to 32. I want to know more. What's that telling us? Uh, what's happening with young people, both men and women, that they would seek to exploit and profit from uh, uh, the sale of other young people? Majority are males so far, but we've seen an increase in what you may say underage traffickers. And there's been some big cases in Ontario of, of where underage uh, youth have been charged with human trafficking and are doing some serious time in jail. I, again, I think this is something we have to work on as a, as a society what's happening. There can be some association with street gangs. Often it can be more casual though. Traffickers will work. It'll be part of a family um, initiative. We're supporting one woman who's kind of under the control of a whole family and even though the one person's in jail, the other family members are kind of moving her around from place to place. Right now they're primarily Canadian citizens of various ethnicities and um, though we've also assisted in some cases where our men who were trafficking were in Canada illegally and they were deported as part of their sentence. Now from a specifically Edmonton perspective, I can speak to our recent arrests in the last say a couple years or so. Granted, the sample size is small, considering you know to make any vast generalizations from, but but we do see what I th I would say is a overrepresentation of traffickers from Central East African countries. I mean that's our reality. I don't necessarily have an answer for it, but I mean it is it is what it is, as we say in in our business. Uh, I think we can do a better job of tracking this type of information, so we can uh, kind of appreciate why the, the over overrepresentation. Uh, but uh, we do see uh, traffickers from all uh, age brackets as well. Yesterday we arrested a 16-year-old and he was heavily involved in the trafficking of another 16-year-old girl that he'd only recently met at the mall and uh, exploited. Um, we've arrested, uh, like Kate has said, uh, girls who have been involved in the industry typically and then find it somewhat easier or more palatable or, or whatnot to ex begin to exploit other young girls rather than having to sell sex themselves. So that's just a, a reality or an interesting dynamic. Uh, again, family, uh, parents exploiting their own children. I mean, we, we have seen it all in Edmonton uh, and it is quite, quite shocking to to, to people to, to realize it's to that extent. So our future approach, I mean, we can and will continue to arrest Johns, uh, buyers of sex. We can and will and continue to participate in, in stop programs and educational programs. Uh, but ultimately, a, a, an issue of this magnitude and of this scale and, and scope that crosses so many lines across society, I mean, we're, we're not going to solve it. We're not going to arrest our way out of it. 
uh, education is the key, clearly. Uh, it needs to be aimed at the general public as well as those specific groups, be it the uh, specific cultures or, or immigrant communities, uh, youth certainly have a, have a are, are key to this. Understanding uh, and appreciating their their perspective on sexuality and uh, healthy relationships and uh, appropriateness of selling sex, buying sex. You know, there's newcomer groups, there's community brokers, there's religious, cultural leaders that all can be uh, approached and 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 uh, relied upon to to make these sort of large societal shifts. And that's you know something that doesn't certainly doesn't happen overnight. Uh, again, there's existing barriers between reporting and uh, and the police, victims of trafficking, exploitation. Uh, sometimes they just don't have a, a good Good understanding or, or, or faith in police and again that's something that we have to accept and own and, and deal with as a, as a service and uh, you know we do our best and, and continue to try to make inroads into the communities so to break down those barriers. A uh, small part of what we've done just recently in Edmonton uh, not necessarily to coincide specifically with the sexual exploitation week of awareness but as a year-round initiative we have a public awareness campaign uh, something that we haven't had the funds or the means to do in the past but uh, certainly we, we, we stepped up and felt that there's just a lack of understanding sexual trafficking ex uh, exploitation it's not well understood it's my opinion that the terminology is confusing to the general public uh, the word trafficking just doesn't resonate with people they just don't get it uh, how, and how it relates to individuals and people uh, there's a, and I mentioned earlier, there's a large segment of the population that just do not know it's illegal to buy sex, and that is the case. And I know at one time it wasn't, but now it is, and, and that message has just not gotten out there probably enough. Uh, and then we just so we attempt to raise some awareness through public uh, campaigns, and again, all the year towards education, prevention, and intervention is the key. Well, we've talked a lot about the sex buyers. And we do know that if there was no demand, there wouldn't be traffickers, there wouldn't be a, you know, a, all the other parts of that circle. It's very hard to get research on how many men buy sex. That's, again, invisible, hard to, hard to get a handle on. But there was one pretty rigorous study that looked at, uh, I think, about a dozen countries around the world, and they tracked what the laws were in those countries, and then they, they calculated how many men might buy sex. So our closest neighbor is the U.S., and the research there shows that between 14 to 20 percent of the men in the U.S. have purchased sex services at least once in their lives. Translating that to Edmonton, you know, of men between the ages of 20 and 79 living in Edmonton, that means there could be up to 68,000 men or more, 68,000 is the 14% who may buy sex at least once in their lives. So as uh, Dale said, we have a really big job to do. It's very uh, complex and challenging. But as we wind up our part, I want to say the flip side is the good news that over 75% of men in Edmonton are not trying to buy sex services, especially from uh, young people. And that there's a lot of really great initiatives in Edmonton that are uh, trying to crack open conversations. There's a group called Men Edmonton that's uh, looking at the impacts of violence both on men and on women and children. There's talk now of toxic masculinity. I'm not the expert on that. Uh, but, but we're cracking things open in our society, uh, which I think is really, really encouraging. So we, uh, we wanted to lend on that positive note. And when Jordan wraps up a little bit later, she's going to talk about some of the organizations that offer different kinds of support for men. I always say at the Sex Trade Offender Program, especially in that healthy sexuality part, I'm proud to live in a city that uh, has men's groups as part of the work of the city. And we also say, we care about you. That's why we offer this program. And people give up their Saturdays to come and uh, educate. And one reason is 
the, the risk of suicide among men is very high in Alberta. So what do we need to do to crack open opportunities for men to talk about self-esteem, healthy sexuality, healthy relationships, and that's going to be one piece of this very complex puzzle of ending the demand. So I think that is our yeah. official part. It is, yep. This is just uh, one example I just wanted to show you. This is a, uh, out or sort of the education awareness campaign that we're putting out there right now, and this is one billboard that was uh, just a picture of my phone with. So the tagline is, what if it was your daughter? Just to get people thinking, the buyers thinking. And the another one here on the back end of a bus is, uh, what will your wife think? Again, just to uh, bring something to, or cause the buyer to think. And again, it has that small tagline on the bottom, buying sex is a crime. So again, uh, just to drive that point home. And, and again, it, th these ads will appear, buses, billboards, this uh, View magazine, which uh, has a reputation of advertising for sexual services through body rub centers, as well as uh, bars and restaurants along White Avenue and Jasper Avenue. So something that we'll, again, it's, it's difficult to measure. You, d you don't have any means to necessarily know what impact it has, but uh, you certainly uh, can't hurt for trying. So that is a formal part of this, open to questions. and. Uh, and that's the part I tend to like the most. It gets me away from this podium. <laughs> and we have, uh, we've booked the room till 1.30. We appreciate that some people may have to leave right at uh, 1 for their lunch hour, but the rest of you are welcome to stay. Okay. Um, we have a few questions on this one. Uh, what drives the demand? in terms of body rubs, body rub centers? Well, I'm not necessarily sure I can actually know, I know that answer. I mean, a lot of what we tried to discuss here is is, is getting at that exactly. Like what, what drives the demand? What, you can go very philosophical on the issue and what, what allows a man to think it's appropriate and, 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 uh, and all right to pay for sex from another human being, right to all the factors that Kate spoke of in terms of loneliness and, and greed and drugs and, and it, you know those so it, it, I don't know I don't know if there is a simple answer to the question what drives it human nature to some degree I suppose sex nobody's against sex every, you know we're, we're not <laughs> but uh, you know appropriateness of, of uh, is what everyone is what we're trying to the point we're trying to make um, how does racism play a factor when purchasing sex Again, another relatively <laughs> loaded question, but very complex answer. Like, you know, not to s let's not deny it. I mean, the women that work on the street historically are Aboriginal. Uh, is there an element, uh, and our buyers are not, to be quite frank. There's very, very few Aboriginal men that we're, what, that we're arresting. I mean, predominantly, uh, uh, well, as the stats bear out, issues, uh, you know, there's concerns around the immigrant community and new Canadians, but you know, 50% are white males. And when white males are buying sex from uh, Aboriginal women who are trauma uh, marginalized and desperate, there, some would say there's an element of racism there for sure. Uh, there's, there's some interesting study uh, out of the University of Minnesota. We had a guest speaker here in January. And in uh, Minnesota and other parts of the United States, uh, there's many uh, women of African Canadian, uh, African American heritage who uh, are exploited either as youth or as adults, and there's been some research done around its uh, an, a reenacting of slavery, and so that's why men are <laughs> buying African American women. I think we again, this is something else we have to confront in our society. We only know a little part of it, but it's uh, it. Uh, racism is definitely an element. Yeah, and uh, in terms of body rub centers, again, as we mentioned, some of the centers uh, are Asian themed, are Asian staffed, and again, that is purposeful. That is intent to attract men who are uh, fascinated with the Asian Asian culture and Asian uh, women and, and appearance and the, the stereotype that goes along with it. 
uh, that could be construed as racism, certainly. I'd just like to add something to this as well, because there is this image towards Asian women, and we're trying to do some uh, research uh, about this in particular, because there are more Asian women in Canada who are in massage parlors, say, than, than women who are of African Canadian heritage. So we want to understand that a bit more. And meeting with, uh, me meeting with several women, um, they talked about how they, they actually are therapeutic massage therapists and what they endure because men always want to, them to provide a happy ending and they simply want to do a therapeutic job there as a profession. So I then began asking women in, um, women of different heritages, I go to regularly for massage therapy, have you ever been asked by a man for a happy ending? And they said it happens all the time. So this is something that we have to understand. There's one woman, a therapeutic massage therapist, who's left her profession because she cannot take the harassment from men always pressuring her for more than a therapeutic massage. Um, typically, do women in body rub centers know our laws? Um, for example, this person visited one and the women didn't know it is illegal. Um, to buy but not to sell? Well, it's covered in the course. So uh, the city makes a really clear, uh, it's there. I don't, know, uh, I don't know why they didn't know that, but that's the first thing that's covered in the information course before you get your license. And I, I will say, again, I think that might. Uh, it's not dissimilar from John saying, well, I didn't know it was devised, I didn't know it was illegal. Well, you know, the other side of that coin is, is it comes with the confusion around the laws, I suppose, and uh, why, why can they sell but nobody can buy? So, again, that is, an instruct, that is instructed in the course and, and information is provided. And when they're meeting, practitioners are meeting on a regular basis with uh, bylaw inspectors and police officers and, and things. So. There really shouldn't be a, a case where a woman doesn't understand the complexion of the law, uh, but it, it certainly is is something that is, uh, you know, nobody's naive. We all know that sex is being bought in body rub centers. Uh, it's that, but again, it's that harm reduction approach that the city takes. I think I'd like to say one little thing about the the law and why why this it's legal to buy, uh, not illegal to sell, and you can advertise your own sex services, um, but not those of others. The the shift in our country uh, was that a recognition of women's inequality, a recognition of the violence that is part of the sex trade. And that uh, you know the government had heard from many women who asked why they were being arrested, why they were being stigmatized, when you know when the economic and um, and we've heard about racism, we've heard about violence, we've heard about all these things. So that is why uh, the government changed the law to no longer arrest those who provide their own sex services, but to hold to accountability those who are seeking to buy because it's perpetuating you know, perpetuating this circle. The other reason around advertising is uh, if I choose to advertise myself, that's one thing. But if I forced Dale to provide sex services and I, I advertised, then I'm exploiting him or, you know, or her. So there's, there's, there's a lot of fine nuances in the law that people don't fully understand, but those are the, the reasons behind the law. Yeah, the crux is, the law doesn't want to be, see, be seen as criminalizing potential victims. Um, this just kind of expands on what you were just talking about, but when did buying sex become illegal? And if it is a crime, how does EPS deal with body rubs? Um, is it a blind eye for harm reduction? December 6, 2014, the law was enacted. In order to yeah. And again, that's prior to that, the existing laws were prostitution at the time. That's the word the that was used in the day, uh, was legal. So it was legal to buy sex in Canada. You just couldn't do it in, pri it just couldn't do it in a public place. You couldn't communicate for the purpose of prostitution in a public place. That changed when they said you cannot buy sex under any context in any circumstance. P 
pub, public, private, and whatnot. So that was a shift in the law. That's again, uh, again, probably part of the confusion. Uh, and how do police enforce through body rub centers? Well, I, I got to be a little bit careful in a public forum to talk too much about what we try to do from uh, uh, through techniques and, and operations and whatnot, but I will say that it is challenging to say the least because you can probably imagine what happens behind closed doors between two individuals uh, who neither are inclined to want to confide in the police. One is making money and one is breaking the law that we have very little ability to hold the buyer accountable. The, the woman is not breaking the law in any, in any, in any uh, fashion. Um, have the men in the STOP program ever had their ACE score, so their Adverse Childhood Experience scores, measured? No, uh, but I really appreciate that question. Uh, one, our, our approach to ACE, uh, Adverse Childhood Experience, uh, as CEASE, is that we actually ask our counselors to do that with the um, the women and men we refer to counseling because we do not see ourselves to be counselors and those A scores we believe can open up a lot of pain. Now that being said, throughout the 22 years that we've been offering this program, there have been clearly men who uh, experience childhood abuse and other uh, forms of terror. And what we have done, both myself and the police officers, when we've seen, uh, you know, if a man's been triggered by something that uh, has been spoken or said or an image, we've taken that man aside and we've, uh, you know, we've talked very quietly, respectfully to him just to bring down the anxiety. And we always make sure that men walk out of the STOP program with one of those little brochures. They're on the table. Uh, and we, this is why we stress so much counseling and there are services, whether it's free counseling from the city or whether it's specialized counseling from sexual assault center or uh, anything. We, we put it all here because we want men who have suffered uh, childhood abuse and what we know often is that the dynamic is that the a man who suffered childhood abuse may then act out as a perpetrator, and a, a woman uh, may act out may uh, who suffered childhood abuse may be more vulnerable to exploitation. So we, we try to look at the power dynamic, but I don't think we would issue the ACE score because I don't don't feel that would be responsible unless we had a psychologist there all day who is, uh, who conducted the ACE score. So that's my answer. I'm open to talk to whoever answer, asked that question afterwards because maybe it's something we need to add, but I would add it very carefully. Um, when individuals are trafficked slash bought or brought to Canada legally, what happens to them following apprehension? So um, are they deported? What if they're from dangerous homes? What are their options? So if a victim of trafficking who has no uh, legal status in Canada, it's not a Canadian citizen, not a landed immigrant, uh, comes to the attention of the police as a complainant, then other uh, resources are brought into play, Canadian Border Services typically, and they have the ultimate uh, authority in, in, in terms of allowing that person to remain in Canada. There is mechanisms in place that allow them to remain in Canada pending the, the uh, pro court process uh, and other, other uh, procedures that they can take to either gain status in Canada or, or whatnot. So outside of the purview of the local police services, but uh, certainly something that we, we uh, work with our partners around and, uh, and know it's not as simple as de deportation. That is seen now by, well, not just now, but I mean, it's it's a, probably a misunderstanding to think that the system was so uh, cruel and lacked understanding that they deport these people uh, just just as a matter of course. I'd like to say that I'm 
proud to be an Albertan as well as an Edmontonian. And our Alberta Solicitor General uh, Victims of Crime Fund funds uh, one bed always at a women's shelter. Now that may not mean the, the actual bed in the shelter, but funds the capacity to, uh, you know, sometimes women need to be moved, say, from Edmonton to Rocky Mountain House. So we have developed as a community some very good protocols for e immediate support through the women's shelters movement, and also through the work of ACT Alberta, Action Coalition on Human Trafficking. They are the tops in helping uh, internationally trafficked persons um, g obtain T TRPs, is that it? Temporary, res temporary residence permits where they can then have access to health care and housing and income support. We are the leaders in Alberta uh, in that area. Uh, at, some, at the same time, some women um, want to go home or some of the men who have been victims of labor trafficking want to go home. So again, through ACT Alberta and other partners, uh, you know, we've arranged to get people back home. Cease and ACT work together to help a woman get back to an Asian country and she phoned our victim advocate and she couldn't speak very good English but she just kept saying, thank you, thank you. Yeah, and, yeah, and just uh, maybe extend on that a little bit, domestically, or women traffic domestically. Uh, there are uh, companies, WestJet being the primary one, that will provide free flights for an individual who needs to uh, return back to their to their city. So lots of lots of people stepping up, uh, agencies as well as corporate uh, companies. Um, what impacts does the shutdown of Backpages.com have? I think it's just too early to tell. Right now, we're making uh, uh, our own, doing our own sort of behind the scenes research and 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 uh, sort of. Uh, inroads into some of the different sites out there but right now like this today the market is is, uh, is spread around where before like I say it used to be a sort of amalgamated un under the umbrella of backpage.com now there's just six or seven eight different sites out there where where people are advertising or, or posting ads so uh, right now it's just the market's dispersed and we just have to figure out which one of these ads is uh, or sorry, which one of these sites might be the most uh, lucrative for police to infiltrate and to be on in terms of looking for, for escorts to engage in and uh, offer outreach to, as well as to target Johns. I think the closure or seizure of Backpage.com, in addition to everything Dale has said, it, it provides us some opportunities. And those opportunities might be to um, be there for people who are looking uh, for ways out. So for example, again, uh, one of the women we, we work with, I mean, she relied on uh, escorting income to pay the bills. So we've been actually able to pay off uh, her rent <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and a phone bill. So I wanna say, if any of you know people who are hurting, who want to you know, explore uh, you know, pathways, we're open and, and that's what I mean, a cri this is a crisis. Backpage is seized. Know how to advertise, to, uh, all of that. Let's also remember in the seizure of Backpage, there are, uh, you know, that's where people were being trafficked. That's where some uh, children were being uh, advertised. And so we, we need to look at the whole complexity and we need to see what is the opportunity to be able to find those who are uh, looking for help. Yeah, and just to really quickly give some understanding of why it was shut down, it's it's the freedom of expression laws in the United States that changed, that create that created a situation for the owners of a website like Backpage.com and many others that are similar, can no longer hide behind the law or hide behind the law that uh, prevented people who misused their site. Now they can be held accountable, so that's why it was shut down is because. While it was always or while it was always recognized as being misused, it was the individual that was misusing it, not the court, not the company Backpage.com. The laws changed, and overnight, those owners were breaking the law. That doesn't exist in Canada, so there are, the websites can still be up. You can see them in Canada, uh, and that's why there's and there are some uh, that are based out of Canada. But that's where we'll we'll never see that. We'll, 
not necessarily, not never, but we won't likely see that in Canada where those websites will not be allowed to exist on the internet. Obviously, policing the internet is very, very complicated. And, uh, you know, people can operate their websites with servers in foreign countries and, and things like that. So, so it's not as simple as, you know, putting a, well, Donald Trump thinks it is, putting a wall around your borders. But uh, that, that just gives some context. So it's not like the sites will disappear. It's not like advertisements will disappear. And, and again, the police can still be out there and we will be out there. It's just, it's going to take some time to see where the, how it settles. And it's going to, uh, again, it's going to take all of us eyes and ears. Um, I will date myself, but say back in the 90s when uh, street exploitation activity was at its height, you know, we had 250 children that the police identified, you know, in a couple of core communities and over 750 uh, young people over the age of 18. And the communities worked with the city and the police to create traffic diversion. And yes, it broke the circulating traffic of the men and it began to create safety for children trying to go to school. And it did disperse the activity, so that's what we're going to see here. There'll be a dispersion of different, amongst different sites. At the same time, it mobilized the community to cre begin to create resources, safe houses, uh, transition programs, uh, ways to support people. It, it began to create, the sex trade offender program came out of that, that kind of uh, activity. And I didn't tell you what we do with the fees, but they, the fees from the men come to cease because the police chief of the day and the minister of justice of the day said that the, it was a community that had raised the alarm and talked about the harm. And so we're going to give the money back to the community to help heal the harm. So this money is being used for poverty relief. It's a big chunk of it, poverty relief and uh, counseling and bursaries and uh, you know being used to try to bring something positive. So this is a wake up call when, when Backpage.com got shut down. It's, ho you sh it's a pretty invisible activity unless you're working in the field. But we need, through these ads that the EPS has put out and through these kinds of awareness days, we need to wake up the community about the invisible exploitation. We need to see what are the resources that are needed today and what more can we as Edmontonians do and who do we need to lobby and advocate for, for more resources? That's, that's the opportunity that I see in this seizure, is a lot, we're gonna get a lot more people talking. Um, a lot of the statistics focus on female victims. What is the comparison to male victims or transgender victims? Thank you, that's a really important question. And I would say that male and transgender uh, people are among the most highly invisible. Uh, again, proud to live in Edmonton because as a community four or five years ago now, we did mobilize and we uh, created a program called Below the Belt, a program for men. And it's a very humble program. It opens a couple of days a week and provides STI testing, food, uh, clothing, and uh, peer mentoring. DEXA Transitions program also has a program for men and who uh, you know, have experienced childhood sexual abuse, which may then uh, contribute to vulnerability to sexual exploitation as adults. And so we have a lot to, to learn. The, the harsh reality is that there, the parallels are very similar. There's young men who are trading sex for survival. Uh, there's men, the, the average age range for the men who are using the young men is the same as the average age for the men who are using women, men in their 40s. Often they will give these young men a place to stay and food uh, for a couple weeks and then when they're tired of them, they'll kick them out and then they're back into the, the whole circuit. So I think we need to keep cracking this open and understanding what more we need to do as a community to help young men and trans people. They've tr there's, there's been tr traditional exploitation, like back in the 90s there were young men and there were trans people on the street. Um, now, again, it's all moved in and invisible. So thankfully, we've got some good people working on this in Edmonton. Um, and to build off of that, how about men selling sex to other men? What is the trend slash efforts being made to educate men selling sex to other men? Well, again, I would uh, say that below the belt is, uh, you know, we, they're 
our uh, staff person is doing a really good job educating and again working in partnership with Alberta Health Services and being here today uh, if those of you did not know that below the belt exists, you now do, and you can talk about it. Uh, we have a very humble website that's a little bit out of date, so we, we kind of need help with, with those, uh, those things too, but keep the dialogue going and keep talking about it. And we have made uh, efforts to post ads attracting uh, men wanting to buy sex from boys or other men. We have arrested uh, those individuals, and we also have arrested a couple females too who also look to buy sex. So we, we uh, you know, obviously in the past it was just very much a targeting men buying sex from women, but uh, we're attempting as law enforcement to, to spread our enforcement efforts. Um, two questions. Um, aren't body rub places trafficked victims? Um, if harm reduction in body in body rub centers, why did half of the women surveyed say they were choked, punched, hair pulled on, or, or forced anal sex, forced unprotected sex in top of being bought? What was the first, first question? I think the first yeah. question was, are they not uh, trafficked victims? And this gets into the weeds of the uh, uh, struggles that law enforcement has. how the law defines a, a victim of trafficking and how others might interpret their situation are two different things, or can be two different things. Uh, often the complainant has to, self, has to identify themselves as a victim of trafficking to the police. Uh, they cannot, we cannot assume that they're there of, by force, they're there by, they're by coercion, or they're there by intimidation or threat. They have to tell us that and when we ask them and I'm of no illusions that people lie to the police and when but when they tell us that they're there of their own volition uh, it's difficult for a police officer to call that individual a liar and say no that's not the case you're I think you're a victim so it just doesn't it's very it's very difficult for the police to to uh, navigate that sort of landscape and and we encounter it regularly through e with escorts, through uh, you know any anyone else, a uh, woman on the street. Again, it's not illegal to sell sex, so I can't. I have no authority. I have no law that allows me to to stop that person doing what they're doing any longer in Canada. So if they tell me they're a victim and they seek out our assistance and help and want to identify uh, a, a trafficker or the person behind the scenes, absolutely, we're. We're there to assist and, and there to pursue those investigations. But if they do not, and they choose not to engage the services of law enforcement, then all we can do is offer our support and, and be there when they're ready, if they are in fact a victim. There are many, many women out there that are self-empowered and are ta making the conscious decision to sell sex. We can't deny that, it's, it's, it's lucrative. They can make money in that, in that way, and more money than they may have other options to do. Uh, they can make upwards of $300 in an hour, and uh, obviously that's not maybe an option that they would have otherwise. So they can make that conscious decision uh, to sell sex, and that's something as police officers we have to respect if that's, the case, if that's what they tell us. And I think this will be the last question. Is it the last one? And then I know, I know we need to wrap up. Uh, essentially, a CEASE did a survey in 2015 of about 50 women in body rub parlors where they reported, we just asked them, you know, what is safety to you and, and what do you experience? So they did uh, a number reported to us about being slapped, choked, uh, held down, uh, forced to do things that they did not uh, negotiate. And I think that that brings the awareness that what happens behind closed doors is is it maybe another story. I think with respect to the um, uh, looking at safety in body rub parlors and 
harm reduction, I would like to invite our city to go farther and ensure that all the work being done around body rub centers is linked to the work around gender-based violence uh, and poverty Edmonton, mental health and wellness. It has to be seen as part of a whole approach by our city. And we have to expand what does harm reduction mean and look at all, all of the factors. And, and for me, what's really important is to look at the income drivers that drive women into parlors uh, when uh, they cannot find employment in our city to provide for themselves and their families. Do we have time for this all? I think we need to just Sorry. wrap it up. Let's just see what it was. Was it just, does EPS have stats online? Oh, does EPS have stats online anywhere about the no, nothing like this. We, we have a EPS webpage, but it doesn't include stats like this. And um, can you share whether there's been any 911 calls to body rub centers so far in 2018? Hmm. Well, I'm certainly not privy to every call that we are dispatched to, but I do get alerted to uh, uh, major ones, I'm sure. And I can think of one off the top of my head, two maybe. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dale and Kate. Um, thank you for joining us for today's Lunch and Learn, and um, thank you so much to McEwen University for hosting us. We appreciate the space. Um, for anybody who would like to view this session again or would like to share it with a colleague or coworker who wasn't able to make it today, it will be posted on our website and on YouTube, as well as our um, Sexual Exploitation Week of Awareness proclamation that took place on Monday. Um, and just to reiterate what Kate has said, we're very fortunate that Edmonton has so many resources for um, both men and women that are struggling with exploitation or mental health or any, any other services they may need. Um, there's DEXA, Blow the Belt, City of Edmonton has several men's groups, Men Edmonton does, uh, SACE goes into schools and provides uh, healthy masculinity courses for younger boys, uh, and TFC has uh, women's only groups and men's only groups as well. Um, and then again, to go back to our flowers, our, our elder Gloria Laird was not able to join us today, but we will be send, sending the flowers to her as a thank you for all her support to the Sexual Exploitation Working Group as well as Child and Family Services. So thank you very much.